I hope you can hear me. If there are technical issues, uh, I can come back. I feel privileged to share some uh, elements of my work with you. You are a specialist on open data. I'm proud of my colleagues and of the partners that are here. As the uh, host has told us, I've worked at the city of Montreal for the last eight years, and I work on fighting um, racism and systemic discrimination. I can share the intersectionality between having data and what it means in terms of equity and inclusivity, notably with racism. Another I like says that racism is making a tragedy and uh, an accident. My work is to consider those accidents, see how often they are present, and to see what are similar or different to understand the tragedy that occurs at a certain scale, whether it's at, in a city, in an institution, a province, or in a society. I'll first talk about the engagement from the city of Montreal on diversity inclusion. My office was born after a citizenship uh, action so that the city uh, would be accountable. M many Montrealers signed a pe petition about this. There was then a consultation in the whole city, in all territories of the city, to talk to Montrealers. 38 recommendations emerged when I arrived in January. When I started in January, there was already a roadmap. There are different orientations. Outside recommendations need to be adjusted. These elements are important. And I'll let tell you about the importance of open data to evaluate what people who experience discrimination feel. The creation of this office is important. Montreal citizens at are 35% uh, uh, of Montrealers are from uh, minority visible minority groups, but not in not too long it will be 56%, not including uh, indigenous populations and uh, ethnical groups that have been here for a long time. It is a reality that we need to take into consideration, and these people are concerned by the changes we need to implement. We work together because we need to work on those so-called accidents with people that can change things in day-to-day uh, -day life and that are in positions of power so that they can affect change. I'd like to come back to the type of recommendations and data were put forward by the consultation and what asks came out of it. As part of these recommendations, there are three profile of recommendations. First of all, number five, it's recommendation number five. It's producing that comparative data that's differentiated to measure uh, gaps between uh, racialized populations and others. We need to guide public action from the administration. Other recommendations on data have to do with racial profiling. I will talk about this. So racial and social uh, profiling. And the last type has to do with data and recruiting and development of city employees. For example, the different recruitment 
within HR, which is a sector with which we work a lot. What this means is that Montrealers who have put forward the daily accidents, for example, with the city of Montreal, have talked about creating data, sharing data, and communicating this data. Racism is a process of exclusion. Racism is a process of exclusion and distanciation, so it's an attack on democracy. What does that us uh, can do for anti-racism and equity, it's to build confidence uh, with communities, or trust, rather. These people are closest to people that are affected. These people need to have tools in a technical way and for data architecture and analysis, but they have the capacity to be part of a global vision. I won't come back on the COVID example, but uh, I have an example to mention during questions and answers. Having data available can reduce uh, perceptions that can uh, be thought of if there's no data. On that the fight against racism, people uh, that are concerned need to be at the heart of the access to data, at, in publication of data, in creating this data, and access, in accessibility of, to data, which what I call translators. We need to be able to fight the instrumentalization of these accidents in the city. That helps us understand what's going on, but they also help us act in a more just manner. We have to see how this data helps us see our uh, urban spaces. For example, if we're talking about parks or green spaces, we can understand the realities of certain uh, racialized populations or others that are excluded and are vulnerable in various ways. It's important to know how many indigenous women uh, get uh, uh, tickets. What's important is that once we have this data, we have to see how an institution can use that data and adjust its intervention practices in these different situations, whether those that like their police, uh, community services, or inclusion services. So how do we make data talk? There are, of course, challenges in producing data, and I can say this clearly, but in Montreal, we are committed to be an organization that is constantly learning. We need to increase the trust of people of color or indigenous people who are victims of discrimination. It allows us to create a common goal. And it is the antidote to exclusion. And this is beneficial to everyone. I'll take two examples that we work on every day with the team. And this presentation was co-created with that team. So we have the issues on racial and social profiling. And on the other hand, we have equity, diversity, and inclusion. So for both of these things, whether it be internal issues as an employer in the city or external a relationship with people, it allows us to highlight incidents, but it allows us to orient what we're doing for the matter of profiling. If you read La Presse this morning, there was a report that was published on interactions 
of the people of Repentigny. Repentigny, for those who don't know, is part of the metropolitan area around Montreal. The police director, who is currently working on an organizational change, mentioned this morning that some numbers are hard to hear. And I think that that's a very significant quote. Certain police services have noticed that their intervention practices can show systemic profiling, whether they like it or not. Sociologists and ethnographs and have been talking about trust between racialized populations and police services. I would like to invite you to read On the Run by Alice Goffman. And there is so much research that qualifies that report, but you also have to examine quantitative data. The perception that people have with public safety institutions has to do with trust and transparency. We need to work on that by having a public safety approach that is fair and equitable for all. And it needs to go through a culture of data collection. And if there is no true research culture, well, collecting data might be a bit of a Band-Aid solution if there's a crisis. If things are done properly, usually we examine the quantitative aspects of an intervention, but we need to look at both the quantitative and the qualitative data. When information is not collected uniformly, it's difficult to examine the solutions and have an optimal solution. We want to reduce social and racial profiling. And in order to do so, data collection needs to be done properly in order to detect and eliminate potential systemic biases. And we need to promote substantial equality. The question is, when we move from qualitative to quantitative data, what do we do? How does this orient our public action? Open data is a trust building exercise. In Montreal, police services were able to work with researchers, the same who published the report in Repentigny, and were able to detect a, a, an over-representation of people and offenses. And this can help orientate the practices of a certain of any certain organization. In Montreal, for example, they created a policy on interventions and they are working towards police intervention without discrimination. Some say that it's not enough, but we need to consider all of the organizational changes that need to be made in order to reach a goal that is shared. We need to recognize, of course, systemic racism, but we also need to work on a daily basis to counter it. Is that enough? No. There are, of course, accidents that we continue to see on the daily, and there aren't changes that are important enough. But the Canadian and Quebec context, and in all cities, well, we need to look at all the issues where things have changed over years, over the years. And there are some good practices in Quebec or Montreal or in Ontario or in certain police services. For example, as Anna mentioned, what happened in Kingston. If I come back to EDI and internal things. Why would the why would an employer look at that kind of data? We need to examine what we might be missing if we're not highlighting certain points. Inaccessibility to data doesn't allow institu institutions to react. So it creates 
chaos that is based on perceptions. And regarding EDI, it's important to ensure that we understand the importance of data in order to rectify problematic things. All of these interactions and work relationships need to be focused on data and equity. We can ask ourselves certain questions. The evolution of salaries, for example, is it fair for someone, for a person of color versus somebody who is not a person of color? The careers of a person of color or a person with disabilities or an indigenous person, do they have a similar profile to somebody who is not? We examined many issues while looking through a woman's lens, and we need to also add to that lens a lens of anti-discrimination, basically. We want to see how discrimination and racism have an impact. Can it be measured? Discrimination and harassment, can it have an impact on mental health? Can that be quantified with insurance providers? Data allows us to show that the measures that we take for inequality and to fight racism, these are all things that are there to rectify problems. They're not there to focus on certain populations more than on others. And there's a lot of issues still, a lot of denial around racism, even though structural changes are moving forward. I hear a lot that a lot of people that say that I don't believe in the narrative of racism or it's only a matter of perception. As I said, data is an important state that needs, an important thing that needs to orient our decisions. As a society, this data needs to serve everyone, regardless of the environment that they grew up in, for example. And regarding issues of racism, we can continue to look at accidents with a certain perspective and say, too bad, we have recurring issues without our public action being fair towards everyone. Or we can see that these accidents are opportunities to react properly so that things are fair for everyone. I don't know if I will be illuminating you this morning, Richard and guests, but good morning and thank you. I am a knowledge sharer and a creative. And today I had the pleasure of discussing equity, inclusion and open data along with my fellow expert panelists. Starting with uh, Tracy Leroux. Dr. Tracy Leroux is an associate professor of critical media and big data. School of Journalism and Communication at Carleton University. Cross appointed to Digital Humanities and is board member of the Institute for Data Science. As a data and technological citizen, she examines large and small complex systems with the hope of making them more just, inclusive, equitable, and environmentally sustainable. I'm also joined with Sunita Kosaraju. And Sunita serves, currently serves as a director, capacity and transformation branch of Ontario's anti-racism dictorate, directorate, pardon me, Sunita. So that's the ARD. In this role, she leads initiatives aimed at creating an anti-racist culture within Ontario public service and broader public sector. Sunita has a wealth of experience at intersection of public policy and data analytics honed through her experience in the OPS and globally. 
Also, we are joined by Norfell Testioni. Norfell um, has more than 15 years of experience in technology and nonprofit industry. Today, Norfell is the co-founder and CEO of Career Tech, which I have to say I did see at Civic Tech Toronto. And so welcome, Norfell. And a nonprofit organization that supports LGBTQ2S plus people to get access and thrive in the tech industry. Tracy, if you'd like to get us started with this conversation, please briefly reintroduce yourself. Um, I might have missed a few things. And also, if you can please explain how equity and inclusion is involved and related to the work that you do. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, depending on where you are in uh, the time zone. It's really nice to be here. Thanks very much, Kejo. You did great on the introduction, so nothing to add. Um, the work that I do at Carleton University as a critical data studies scholar is really about considering um, intersectional issues when it comes to data and data infrastructures. Most importantly, what I really spend my, my time on is thinking about some of the foundational or framework data that are required to support other data sets. By framework data, I'm thinking about things such as uh, maybe the boundary files from a geography perspective, uh, within which we might add some other statistics. I might think of the road network files, or I might think even of some satellite imagery. Uh, because I also work in digital twins, I'll be thinking of three dimensional and real time types of data. And I think of equity and inclusion and intersectional issues in very simple flat file data systems, but also how does it look like in the context of a smart city and how might that also look in the context of uh, a digital twin. What I really also fundamentally care about is, of course, the ethics, um, the uh, foundational data, data quality, data standards, uh, interoperability. But I'm also really care about ensuring that we collect the right data about the right people, but in collaboration with the people who are represented in those data sets. So I spent a little bit of time in the past year working with uh, disabled people in ensuring that uh, custodial housing, a form of housing that is not actually currently created in a database in Canada is actually accounted for. We collect, we created some hackathons uh, and some crowdsourcing activities across the country to try and get people to start contributing into building that foundation database so that we could get people on the front lines of the vaccine, but also to bring forward this issue that there are some data invisibilities. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say, and I'll pass it back over to you, Keijo, is this issue of data invisibility is absolutely uh, something that we must consider. Why do we count things in the first place? We count things to make things visible. Why do we make things visible? So that we can act on the things that have been made visible. But what we want to ensure is that what we make visible are the right data, and that they don't reinforce bias and inequality. And therefore, that has to be done, as I was saying earlier, in collaboration with the communities. I also do a little bit of work with OLIP, the uh, uh, Ottawa Local Immigration Group. Uh, they have a data working group with about 35 or 40 uh, different community-based organizations in the city that are looking at equity and inclusion. And we just finished 15 interviews with a, a number of local advocates to try and understand how they collect their data within their infrastructure structures so that we can try and find a way to standardize those and then elaborate a conversation so that in the case of a vaccine as happening now that there there are data where we can actually go out and do some outreach with people so i'll leave it at that and i'll and i'll answer more when the next questions come thank you very much thank you tracy and yafel would you mind reintroducing yourself please and let me know exactly or let us know how equity is inclusion e equity and inclusion is involved in your work other than just the title of queer tech i imagine there is more that you would like to add so please let us know Absolutely. Thank you so much, Nafal Testowny. Again, I'm co-founder and uh, CEO at QueerTech. We're a nonprofit, very young nonprofit, started in 2016 uh, and really start growing rapidly across Canada. And, and one of the mission as a nonprofit is really creating programs to serve the community. So, you know, our first base, we're consumer of data. And, and one of the things that we realize as we look at looked for data is that we couldn't find 
a lot of data sets that we need as an organization around the LGBTQ community and the tech community to really build this program. So one of the things we did is we are also looking to become producer of the data. We're conducting a huge research study to understand LGBTQ experiences in tech and really be able not only to use that data, but provide it. Now, um, something that's really important is when we look at a community uh, like ours, LGBTQ, that sits at a huge intersection of ethnicity, race, and sexual orientation, one of the things that we have seen is that, and, and you know, uh, Tracy have um, mentioned that, is that there is a, a lack of visibility. You know, we don't see ourselves in a lot of the data sets that they are created by governments. You know, for myself, uh, you know, I, I look at my identities and the different identities that I have, and sometimes it's lacking. The second um, part is also being correctly represented in the data sets. And the reason I mentioned this is because, you know, a lot of people are saying, well, you know, we've been collecting data around LGBTQ people for a while, federal government have been doing it around, especially around health surveys. Uh, but Uh, you know, there is a lot of academic research made, and Nicole uh, Denier, that's called the Research Note on Canada's LGBTQ data landscape, uh, where we are and what the future holds. And it really lay out why the way uh, we are asking questions is yielding cor uh, not correct data. So that's really important. And uh, the second part is talking a little bit about that visibility and why it's important. In the literature review that we've been conducting, we've realized that there is, um, you know, in a lot of the studies that are uh, population-based surveys, you know, an evenly focused on lesbian and gay men and really erased bisexual people. And we've seen also in a lot of the uh, employment experiences surveys that's been done in the past that they tend to exclude bisexual, transgender, queer, and two-spirited individuals. So as you see, a lot of this work, uh, we just delete certain populations and and there are reasons for that right we are a, a smaller group of the population and as you go down certain group it's a smaller and smaller but doesn't really justify that uh, these populations should be deleted for the data because it has a huge consequences on how governments creating policies and programs how uh, nonprofit organizations and civil communities are are working with that data to serve these communities Thank you, Nurafa. And yes, that is a very clear point on even the size of the population. But in a longer discussion, I can't help but wonder if that's also the culture and, and the binary culture that we're in that doesn't really necessarily lend itself. And as an information professional, I do have a few things to add, but I will wait <laughs> because I really would like to hear from Sunita and I would like for her to reintroduce herself and tell me something about her work right now that is involved with data and inclusion and invisibility. Good. Thank you so much. A pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm the acting director of the Capacity and Transformation Branch within the Anti-Racism Directorate in the Government of Ontario, which um, is, uh, you know, has a staff of over 65,000 people and oversees all sectors within the province. Um, and my shop uh, basically oversees both sort of two aspects of um, change when it comes to anti-racism and, and, and embedded racism within uh, both our government and within our province. Uh, and that's, you know, the, the culture change. And so the training and attitudes, um, beliefs, and, and those pieces that people uh, need to become aware of uh, and the learning and unlearning there. Um, but the other piece of what we do and that's more um, directly relevant to uh, our conversation today is around our race-based data collection. Uh, we are the owners and stewards of the anti-racism data standards, which are a series of best practices related to uh, the collection, preparation, analysis, reporting, and use of race-based data. Uh, and it's one of the first of its kind, uh, definitely within Canada. Uh, it's a set of 43 standards that 
Read as best practices and were developed in 2018 and are publicly available uh, for any um, you know, organizations to use um, and really serve to provide a level of consistency, uh, a level of ethics uh, and regularity in the way that race-based data is collected. They focus on four key elements, uh, indigenous identity, race, religion, and ethnic origin. Those are the four data elements that are required by our regulated sectors to collect. And we have three regulated sectors at present, uh, education, child welfare, and the justice sector. And we may be expanding further in the coming years. Uh, so, that, so that is a big sort of um, foundational piece of work that we lead. And related to that is um, really the analytics and data analytics strategy um, for um, both promoting increased data, race-based data collection and being smart about how we use that information uh, to, again, uh, get to the bottom bottom line and the goal of it all, which is to really untangle um, problematic policies, programs, attitudes, and data as we know is one way uh, to provide that, um, shine the light on, on where the problems are and how do, we, how do we move forward from there. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Sunita. And yes, it reminds me a little bit about yesterday morning. I'm not sure if my panelists here had an opportunity to listen yesterday morning with champion for BC First Nations data governance, Gwen Phillips. And Gwen, yes, I see you're nodding, Nafel. And one of the things Elder I, I Gwen Phillips. Yes. Elder um, Gwen can, Phillips. Sorry? Elder Gwen Phillips. Uh, yes. Sorry, I was looking at her bio. Yes, Elder Gwen Phillips. Um, and one of the things, I mean, Phillips has, has mentioned a lot of important things, but one of the things that I, she said that, I, that really struck with me is the fact that, you know, we are, um, in terms of looking at the Anti-Discrimination um, Act, and she points out that we are not measuring race, but rather racism. And that is something important to realize when collecting this data and, or any kind of community-led community data. So as community leaders are involved in some way, how and why should community leaders be involved in data collection about the community? And if you have something, please add more around um, in terms of public engagement and to create the kind of impact you want with that data. Um, Sinita, would you mind going next, please? Yes, absolutely. Um, what we know and understand and what I personally understand as a woman who's, who's racialized herself is there's often, uh, more often than not, there's a lot of distrust in providing race-based data. Why? Because uh, there's not a lot of confidence that it will be used to your benefit and, and could be used uh, to your disadvantage. And that attitude, uh, you know, is, is prevalent. Um, and so it's a barrier and, and poses a problem for those who wish to collect race-based data. And so the role of community um, is important in order to provide the information awareness and really create that engagement and buy-in from community to help them understand and have that discussion around how will this data that we're collecting here, that we're aiming to collect here, come back and be of benefit to you? Why should we trust? Why should you trust those who are collecting the data? How is it going to be protected? Um, what will and won't be done with the data? And it's these conversations that are very crucial and within our anti-racism data standards, we provide uh, guidance on, on conducting those engagements and consultations and they are a requirement for, for those sectors who are um, required to follow the data standards. Um, but also their best practice because 
though it seems like a soft type of thing and a slow way to start, it's actually um, the, the only way that you can start um, in order to, you know, create a, a good outcome in the middle and end of the data life cycle, right? Because once you gr create that buy-in and trust, um, what you'll see is that the response rates to race-based data collection go up, right? Uh, the quality of the data can go up because you're really in that process training folks um, for how to how to um, ask these uh, what can be sensitive questions, right? And um, getting to the right people. And so uh, these are all important aspects of thinking through the approach by which you collect race-based data and engaging the community is a really critical first part of it, part of the process. Thank you very much, Sunita. And yes, you've raised some very important points. And I know, Rafael, you, you, you touched on that as well um, in terms of um, asking the right questions. Um, for yourself, Tracy, um, do you have anything to add in terms of public engagement and which part of the um, data collection cycle uh, you have created that sense of, of inclusion um, to ensure equity in the data and the data management? So there's there's a, the famous line that comes from the disabled people community, and that is nothing about us without us. And so that's a fundamental principle that I work by. When it comes to public policy, what I uh, most often do is I do an inventory uh, often of what is contained within open data portals across the country, whether it be at the city level, the federal level, or the provincial and territorial level. And what's very interesting is there's almost none of these types of disaggregated equity and inclusion type of data about most groups in those particular data portals. So that's very interesting that we have open data, but not open data uh, that can help us better understand structural inequality within, within the nation state. If we also want to understand, and so what I do is I'll go, I'll do an inventory, I'll do an assessment, and then I will feed back to all the provinces and territories in the spirit of collaborative critical engagement to encourage the collection and the promotion and the use of those data, but also the public engagement in relation to how you go about collecting those data. I had a fantastic example from a couple of my students last year where they looked at the city of Ottawa portal and they were looking at accessibility in terms of recreation and they were looking uh, at accessibility in terms of physical spaces in the city as well as Open Doors Ottawa. And what they discovered was that the accessibility was defined as a binary and there was a complete lack of understanding of, well, how is, how is someone to know what a yes means in terms of a play structure or a swimming pool or a, a city facility or Open Doors Ottawa as they're an elevator, as they're a back door. And so they had developed a way to maybe do some crowdsourcing through QR codes and surveys to and when people do go to these facilities who are disabled people, that they can give some feedback information as to how to fill in those qualities and how to fill in those, those different characteristics. Uh, another great activity that was organized by Catherine Roy and a really great group called Raplic in the city of Montreal was to actually have a survey and to pair a disabled person together with a geek, so, you know, geeks and nerds like, like myself, and to actually walk the streets to actually conduct a physical survey of places to try and get into change rooms, to try and get into bathrooms, to see if we can actually go and try a pair of pants on. And that survey was actually used as part of a health hackathon, and it actually really brought to the fore, not only for those who are engaged in the collecting of the data, what it really means in reality to not be able to even buy a pair of pants or be able to use a change room like everybody else or even get into a building because there's not even a doorbell that can get people to open the door for you but it also once it was mapped out it demonstrated how inaccessible physical space actually is and it really became clear when we tried to get about 35 wheelchairs at a cafe to have you know your your constitutional après activity beverage so trying to find a place downtown in the city of montreal for 35 wheelchairs is very difficult and then the last thing i will say uh in the in the context of disability right 
right now, I'm also, as you know, Kate, on the multi-stakeholder advisory group to open government. And we have been advocating with not much success, actually, to try and have an inventory done of what the data sets that exist on disability, uh, and then to do an analysis and a gap analysis of those data sets, and then to de develop an advisory board of people of lived experience and experts and specialists in a variety of organizations across the country to help uh, assess the analysis that was done and either A, develop processes and, and procedures to collect new data about this particular group of people, and also to try and find ways to augment other types of surveys and data collection, whether they be administrative data, programmatical data, or statistical data. So those are some of the things I do in terms of public space to try and engage people, to engage the right people who have the lived experience, and so on. I do something similar uh, with First Nations information governance, but I won't get into that conversation today because we have some other great panelists who have things to say. Thanks for the question. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you for raising that. Um, my experience um, with information referral, because I have done resource management and information referral for over six years. And so I'm, I'm getting bits and pieces from each of you, especially what you have spoken on in terms of accessibility and descriptors. And with information referral, you can go on uh, directly online or you can call 211, but it is important to have proper description knowing the level of accessibility of a building, right? Having a ramp does not fulfill um, full level of accessibility. And so I've had the pleasure of working um, with a data manager as well as with a community leader to create those proper terminology and descriptors, and that was a few years ago. So I understand the process and the importance of the impact for the community. All that being said, I'm sure, Nofel, you have more to add. I'm, I'm always coming from the library perspective. I'm always concerned about classification systems and also how they're applied, right? And, and, and if they're applied correctly um, for a specific group. But perhaps you have, because I know you're doing some research right now, if you want to speak a little bit about um, your level of, of public engagement and impact, but also just for yourself coming at it as a community leader um, and, and, and doing your best to speak on behalf of your community. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a couple of things that, that are interesting when a lot of time, you know, we talked about the lack of trust in, in and the transparency in the use of the data, but also there is a lack of representation in the data. A lot of time, I think, especially speaking of the LGBTQ2S plus community, that's really, again, large in terms of race, ethnicity, sexual orientation and lumped into one data set or small data set. A lot of time people will look at reports or look at data sets and they'll say, well, you are talking on my behalf, you're providing a recommendation on my behalf, but I'm not even represented in that data set. So I think it's really important that um, as, as the efforts in terms of collecting data and, and, and representing that data, that we are very clear who this data is representing. And if, if any entities are providing recommendation and reports, that it's very clear who it's done for, right? Like we've seen so much data gap, even looking at all the reports and the academic research through the literary, literature review that we've been doing. And you know, we've seen that our research has a huge lack in terms of, you know, intersectionality and race and ethnicity and physical ability have all been missing from the data sets and yet you look at these reports and and it talks about representing the LGBTQ community but yet you know a lot of these and uh, like people are, are 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 missing from this data and you know when it comes to race and ethnicity especially we do find that a lot of the data sets especially with BIPOC people at the workplace that really lacks the data sets and and especially queer black people and and, and again going down to queer black women right uh, and why because BIPOC folks in general have challenges navigating their ethnicities and and sexual orientation at the workplace and so they choose to conceal themselves. And, and what happened is we focus on white people and white queer men. And, and then we release reports and we say, well, this is an LGBTQ to us plus report about the community at the workplace while mm -hmm. there is an absence of these people. The other thing also we've seen, and, and you know, we've touched base about this, that there is a huge lack of data around you know, people with um, physical and mental uh, disabilities. And, and so uh, really, uh, it really leaves these communities absence from these data sets and these reports, while really it gives this 
uh, impression that people are included in, in, in this report. So, um, you know, as we do public engagement, it's really important that we think about the different communities that we're trying to target and really make sure that there is a representation. And if you don't manage to get that representation, then it is just fair to say that these communities are not represented in these data sets or these reports. Thank you, Jafal. Um, yes, it, it is important to have have everyone in those reports. And yes, you've just given me so much great information here on the intersectionality of things in terms of race and abilities. And um, it's funny because I think I've recently done surveys and, um, and even though it's not something that might pertain to me specifically, I can immediately see because of people I love and know that this would be a very difficult survey for them to complete because it only gives you one option. <laughs> and, and so those are, those are one sets of tools. But do you see any other solutions, Rafael, in terms of, of really getting that intersectionality and, and, and race-based data, like other ideas or research that you're doing that approaches a more of a solution to that data? Yeah, I think one of the things you mentioned is like, uh, you know, even us as an organization that do a lot of work around this, when we try to create forms and surveys and registrations, we ask so many questions, all right, around how are people going to um, categorize themselves in certain categories. And the reality is there is no box that fits all. There is no line that fits all. And and I think, you know, if you are on the data side, on the other sides where you like to have boxes and have clear names for people that they pick from because it makes it easy later to have clean data and manage it, there is also an opportunity to leave people space to really identify themselves the way they see it fit. And maybe I know it's going to be hard in the beginning, but as we see how people are identifying themselves, we can start to also learn a little bit more and progress in these categories that's been created a while ago and just been used over and over for simplicity um, way. But I think if we are trying to understand certain populations and, and create reports and recommendation for them, then we're going to need to leave some room uh, in these surveys and, and and in these um, questionnaires that people are filling out. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you, Rafael. You, you raise a good point in giving people the space to self-identify. And actually, that's funny because that's exactly what was discussed yesterday morning and understanding that things can be nation to nation, community to community, but they need space to um, self-identify. And Tracy, do you have anything else to add on to that? Because I know before you were discussing um, issues of, of doing um, different research and different various levels of government. Are there any solutions in all of this work that you're doing? Uh, there's, there's never one solution that can be universally applied to anything because each is very contingent on the community that you're in. Uh, but absolutely, uh, a fundamental first place to start is with dialogue. Uh, being able to listen and also to acknowledge what it is that is not being accounted for. And I think something that we didn't mention yet, and we really, we ought, I would love to talk more about it, is the sensitivities around dealing with these data. When it comes to LGBTQ and everybody else in between, uh, we know that sometimes people don't want to answer those questionnaires. Um, it depends on the kinds of questionnaires, who's collecting those questionnaires, how those data are going to be used. Are they going to be kept secure? Will they be used against them later? Uh, if we start considering, let's say, in a data brokerage Kind of context or when people travel abroad into countries uh, that uh, vehemently and violently discriminate, discriminate against people. So we need to be incredibly cautious about that. We need to think about the sensitivities also of uh, the how far down to the data point and how many, um, how much anonymization is done. But one of the other things that we also didn't mention was class. We've talked about identity, but we did not talk about class because class is fundamental across all of these identities. If you tend to be the top fifth percentile of the country, many of the issues that affect everybody else regardless don't affect you in the same way. And we ought to absolutely consider uh, socioeconomic issues. The, the greatest difficulty that I have in trying to achieve a solution is this broader systems kind of thinking. And a systems kinds of thinking 
thinking means that we need to think not only of the categories, how we deal with the categories, how we manage the data, how we visualize and represent the data, who we include in the decision-making process, but also how those data ought to be governed more broadly. And then to, how do we engage in critical conversations with community uh, that go vertical and horizontal so that we can get a greater understanding of who we are as a people in this great place that we call Canada and what do we need to do with those data to move forward so that we can bring people equally into the conversation and we can be a lot more inclusive. So a lot of my work over the past 25, 30 years in open data and in the history of the census and saving the census and doing all this kind of work, I even did a critique of the Gay Lesbian Atlas that was published in the States, I think in the year 2000 or something like that, is really use a lot of the scholarly work that I do to unpack these things. I teach 500 students every year about these things and I'm very excited when they leave the program and they can think about these issues because they will go off and they will get jobs in different public sectors and consultancy firms and so on. Uh, but also uh, in a spirit of, uh, as I said before, dialogue. These are difficult conversations. It can't always be you did not do this and you should do this better. It has to really be as a group of people, you as a public servant and as an administrator are also a citizen. You also have family that fit into some of these groups. So how are you as a citizen and as an individual person or a resident of Canada and also in your capacity as a public servant, how are you gonna move forward? And how is it that what I do in my world that can be used to help you out? So that's, you know, again, it's not perfect, a perfect solution, uh, Keijo. There are many, many different solutions from community mapping to developing data portals to doing crowdsourcing. Uh, citizen science is also another fantastic way of uh, doing this kind of work. Community-based hackathons are very useful as some of the ones that I was talking about as well, but also listening. You know, I read a fantastic paper this summer called Crip Technofeminism. And I can tell you that rocked my world because there was a whole bunch of thinking in there that I had not encountered before. But also I'm in a data science and often in a technologically solutionist environment. And so how do I sensitize engineers and data scientists and statisticians to these issues? Uh, they're not sociologists. They're not working in critical data studies. We can't expect them to know everything and we can't expect them to understand everything that we do and everything that's coming forward. So how do we find ways to do this really great cross-disciplinary work together? And I think working with Nafel and Sunita is a really good way to go. And that standard in the province of Ontario is really quite exceptional. I'll leave it at that for now. Thanks for the question. Thank you, Tracy. And Sunita, do you have something to add? Again, I know there isn't a single solution, but perhaps you're working on some solutions right now in your department that you'd like to um, speak a little bit more on at this moment. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, I, I think um, really can't promote those data standards enough. Uh, look, look them up <laughs> if you haven't if you're not familiar with them and you're you're in a space that's looking to start race-based data collection because uh, I think it's to all of our benefit to uh, collect the data in a as consistent and standardized way as we can so that eventually we can cross pollinate and cross map and so our data set uh, becomes bigger bigger and bigger and um, we can really use those insights for good. Um, there's a couple of products that my team is releasing this year. Uh, the first that I'd like to mention is the race-based data collection toolkit, which is a toolkit that supports culturally safe uh, data collection and it provides a um, training module for managers to train frontline workers on how to collect race-based data. Um, and, and, you know, as we know, it's not just a matter of, um, you know, developing a form uh, and putting it out there. There's, there's the conversations that happen. There's the organizational change process that happens that even enables someone to be out there in front in front of you asking for your for your information. Uh, so the ra the race based data toolkit will be released in November of this year. So check out 
uh, ontario.ca slash anti-racism um, for those release for that release. And then the other big release that we're working on is our anti-racism impact assessment, which is a race-based impact assessment tool and really meant to uh, provide a, um, a guide for evaluating uh, your policy program or initiative from a race-based perspective to under uncover any of those biases and, and disparities uh, in how that policy or program impacts um, Black, Indigenous, racialized people uh, compared to white people. And so that by, by actually collecting that data and reviewing it and asking a certain series of, of questions, um, we can sort of uncover um, how, you know, how equitable a policy actually is. You know, a lot of our policies and a lot of the things that, the, the, that, that happen both, you know, through, you know, by government, but, you know, in, in, um, in, in our public, public and private sectors, these policies seem neutral. But in fact, they um, they um, they aren't, and there's intersectionality as well. So the way um, a policy might impact a white man could be very different from how it affects impacts a black woman. And and these are the disaggregations that we um, want to normalize in terms of our policy analysis process. And so look forward to those two um, big releases. Just a quick question, Cynthia. Is that policy involved um, for OPS workers as well as as Ontario um, residents, or is it specific to Ontario residents? Um, because why I'm asking is because things like hiring and inclusion in terms of having high levels of stakeholders makes a difference too in the decisions that are made um, in regarding all of this. So yeah, yeah. So these two products that I flagged and even the data standards and the trainings that we offer as well at, at, um, through the anti-racism directorate um, are fantastic because they can be easily customized to other jurisdictions, um, you know, uh, and to your sector, your specific sector. Um, so, okay. so the tools that I mentioned are, um, you know, will have um, some references to on the Ontario specific context um, but more just as uh, example and not, and, and by no means, um, you know, are these tools unique to be uniquely used within Ontario. So I'm going to wrap up. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Sunita. It was really important to hear all of that. Rafael, do you have any th last minute things do you need to add? Um, perhaps there's a question I did not ask today. I think there is something that we've discussed quickly and, and I'll jump off is, is just there is a danger in how data can be great to create policies and program, but it can also reinforce inequalities, racism and sexism and bias. And I think people who work with the data needs to be really conscious about that. Uh, data, there's stories behind data and we shouldn't forget to look for the stories also sometimes, not just rely on numbers. Thank you. And thank you to all of my panelists today. And I hope all of the listeners and attendees were able to get in a lot of information. And I just also wanted to say thank you to the city of Montreal and the Ontario, um, sorry, the Quebec government, correction again, um, to the government of, of Quebec and to the Canadian Open um, Data Society for bringing this discussion together. Please continue to enjoy this national and international conversation, and you may use the hashtag CODS, C-O-D-S, 21. Thank you.